All right, we are live. All right, they call me the hunter. That's my name. Uh, I'm Jack Mangan of Metal Hall Fame and MetalAsylum.net, and also the Am I Evil graphic novel. We're making some progress there. Uh, I am not alone today. I am with. I can't believe the panel we've got. We're today. We're talking Led Zeppelin, uh, based on the article "Heavy as Lead," which was at uh, the Metal Hall of Fame on the Metal Legacy section, basically arguing about Led Zeppelin's place in metal history. So. I guess I'll introduce I'll introduce my guests one at a time. Uh, we'll start with the amazing. She's well, I, I'm just going to bring her up, and she's the amazing guitar player from Van Zeppelin. She also has her own uh, music. Gretchen Men, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, well, well actually, welcome back. We talked once before with Jennifer Batten. Um, total name yeah. drop there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know Gretchen, and again, you know she's an amazing guitar player. She plays the role of Jimmy Page, basically, in in the Zeppelin cover band. And and you know, seen videos. I've yet to catch you guys live. I can't wait to see you guys live when when as soon as we get the opportunity. But just amazing guitar player who, who uh, performs really great with that. All right, but I mean, I'm going to get to our other guests as well. I'm going to bring in this guy. It's a living legend, uh, someone who actually can claim to have influenced. Led Zeppelin. Well, that can back it up. Actually, did influence Led Zeppelin. I could claim <laughs> it, but someone who legitimately did. Uh, I can't believe. I'm just an honor. We have Carmine and Peace. Thank you so much. Hey. Thanks for joining us. Welcome. Hey, I could honestly say she looks better than Jimmy Page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, granted, absolutely. I will agree with that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, not not so cool. much me. Well, good to be here. Okay. <laughs> Um, I have, but yeah, I, think, I have the award in my studio, that Heavy Metal Hall of Fame award. <laughs> yes, absolutely right. Carmine and Peace of Right was was uh, awarded, inducted, and his brother as well. Vinny yeah. Peace also inducted to the Metal Vinny Hall of Apice, Fame. Vinny Apice. Vinny Apice. That's right. I, can't, you know, I <laughs> forgot that they're brothers, but the last names are pronounced differently. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, so well, let's let's get right into the topic. To you. Like I said, I mean, I mean, you, this panel is amazing. I, you, both of you guys, I hope we can have you both back to just talk to you one on one about your amazing careers and just you know everything. But today we're talking Led Zeppelin. So I mean, Carmen, I guess we'll we'll start with you. Tell us some tell us some good stories about uh, coming up with, yeah. with with Led Zeppelin on the scene. Them opening for you. Hmm. Well, just in a quick a quick story is uh, when they actually opened for us on the first few days they. The promoter didn't want them on because they were we were sold out already. We were playing in Denver. We had about 7,000 seats sold, Vanilla Fudge and Spirit. And, and they had our agent. And the, uh, the promoter, Barry Fay, he was the guy in Denver. He was like the guy. And he said, look, dude, Ron, I don't need Led Zeppelin. It's sold out. You know, it's Jimmy Page's new group. I don't care. It's sold out. So it ended up, they ended up doing the gig. They, they got $1,500 at night for that gig, okay? Which is ridiculous when you think about it now. <laughs> and Vanilla Fudge paid half of it to put them on the gig. So they still owe us for 750 bucks today <laughs> with interest. Anyway, so they went on and, you know, they had no record out yet. This was December 26th. 1968, the record came out in 69 in January. And there was a, a bunch of booze when they went on, which is ridiculous, you know. When you think about what they became. And then John Bonham had seen my big giant drum set that I had, the big maple kit. And he was playing a rented Ludwig kit with a 22 bass drum. My bass drum was a 26. You know, I had the big Tom in the middle. I actually have a picture somewhere of it, uh, you know, my kit with me and John's kit after I got him, the same kit as mine. And when I called Ludwig up, I said, hey, look, there's this band opening up for us called Led Zeppelin. This guy, John Bonham, is really good. He wants a kit just like mine. I think they're going to be big. That's got to be an understatement of five decades. <laughs> and... With that, you know, with me calling them and uh, sending them the record, the first album, they gave John uh, an endorsement. And with that endorsement, it was the same exact drum set that I had. Six months later, they're already getting big. They're as big as Vanilla Fudge. We went on tour. 
we did alternate billing. In other words, we went on first some time, they went on first some time. And uh, we had the same drum set. So when we went on, they take my drum set off and they're gone and they put his drum set on. And I also thought the audience wondered, why they take that drum set off and put the, and then put it back up, you know? So it's just a lot of just a lot of funny stuff like that. You know? <laughs> And and now I, I love the story, I and mean, if you don't mind repeating the story about how you went up to him. I, mean, I don't want to tell the story, but about the triplets, where you thought that uh, he influenced you, and he he thought that you influenced him. Well, yeah, I mean the triplets on good times, bad times. I loved him when I heard him. I said, "Wow, what a great foot this guy's got." So when I met him, I said, "Hey, John, I love you. Yeah, I love that triplet in, in good times, bad times." He said, "I got that from you." I said, "Dude, I don't do that." <laughs> and he pointed out, I don't know where it was on what album or what song, but he pointed it out where I did it. Instead of going like, you know, deco, contento, do that, do that, I went bop, 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 with the snare drum, bop, 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 bop. And he just it, took the triplet and continued. But I guess uh, really nobody in those days were doing triplets on their feet like that, you know? It was a single bass drum. And uh, he just took it and kept repeating it. And it came out good times, bad times, which was I thought was amazing. So I was very surprised when he and told me that. And he actually pointed it out on an album of ours. I don't know which album it was. And that was 50 years ago. Sure. Before she was even born. <laughs> and you, Jack. Yeah, well, before I was born too, but yeah. Um, but uh, Think, well, think yeah. about that to put it in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, it just also shows you the timelessness of this music, of, you know, of all this music and everything that came yeah. from Led Zeppelin. I mean, this stuff is not going to go away. You know, there there were yeah. some great bands that have come and gone, but uh, but Led Zeppelin is just too timeless and too influential, and that's a big well, part of what you know. Different we're talking different about. time in the business too. I mean, now forget about it. As as you know, as Gretchen knows, you you release an album, you know, and it nobody hears it anymore. Like I just told you about that instrumental album. If that was released, you know, in 68, 69, they'd been all over the radio, you know? Sure. The radio doesn't play nothing anymore. They don't play any new groups, you know? And people say to me, who do you like? Who's a, who's a new band that you like, you know? I said, being honest with you, I don't have the time to sit in front of YouTube and punch in new groups and look at them. I used to drive my car, put on the radio and hear new groups. Uh, while I was going somewhere, you know, you can't really listen to YouTube while you're going somewhere in a car, you know, you can't see it. So, <laughs> right. and the fact that back in the day, you get an album, you read about the guy, you know, the girl who's on the album, you know, and they become your idol because you read about them. You don't, you, there's people that look at YouTube, they, you know, you download stuff from Spotify, you don't know who you're listening to. You know, just the name of the band, pretty much. I like to do what Neil Young did and take all my stuff off of Spotify because it doesn't do you any, anything. It doesn't do anything for you. you know? Yeah. You're right. I agree. There's a lot less of a connection without the liner yes. notes, without the pictures. Yeah. I mean, how many new, tell me how many new, um, you know, like uh, guitar player heroes that there are lately or new drum heroes or new bass heroes, new singer heroes in rock. I can't name any. Right. Gretchen, well, we got, can you, you're, you're young to me, you probably listen like to Gretchen more. Mann, that, there's a guitar hero. <laughs> yeah, there's a young right. guitar there hero, it's Gretchen Mann. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know because I, you know, like you said, I think things have changed so much. I think there are certainly newer guitar players who within a, probably a much smaller community than was once, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's Maybe. the idea. You know? Yeah. We don't it's have small, the same. Yeah. 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 We don't have the same household name factor. Uh, one of my good friends, um, Yvette Young, I had dinner with her last night. She's um, like a young, younger, newer, you know, getting just had an Ibanez signature guitar come out. Um, so there, there are, they exist, but I, but it's not the same thing as Jeff Beck. And yeah, Jim I mean, even, <laughs> even with the, even with the Ibanez signature guitar coming out. In the old days, you had guitar player magazine, this magazine, that magazine. And they sold a lot of magazines 
her name and her guitar would have been in there in an ad. You know, right. now it's probably on an ad somewhere on guitarplayer.com, but it gets lost. You know, you know what yeah. I'm saying? It's like, it's just so, so hard to find something today. Well, no. and, and I think you mentioned guitar player. Um, my dad worked there when I was, when I was little and yeah. to hear him talk about how much things have changed and the role that journalism plays within the music yeah. industry. He said when he was there, a guitar player in the early days, they said they felt like they were on this like almost divine mission to deliver great information and unknown guitar players. They yes. put Eric Johnson on the cover and it even said, who is Eric Johnson and why is he on our cover? And people, I think from to hear him tell the stories, they they trusted that. If Guitar Player Magazine said mm -hmm. it, they're going to go out and they're going to buy this guy's album. Yeah, that's exactly right. And then they'd probably hear it on the radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so it all ties in. Yeah, you know, now it's all about social media. And I mean, if Led Zeppelin came out now, they probably wouldn't make it. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's because this guy doing with back back in the day, we didn't have to work at it. We the only you know that was a record company's job. Mm -hmm. You know, not me getting on social media and trying to get people to watch my Facebook. You know, like you have to do. You know, it's exhausting. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. I mean, and I'm I, mean and, oh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but my Facebook, whenever I put something up, you know, like I got this Guitar Zeus box set, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I named off some of the guys, you know, Bumblefoot, Richie Sambora, Brian May, Slash, Neil Young, uh, Neil Sloan, uh, Ingve Malmsteen, John Norm, Vivian Campbell, Ted Nugent, Martin Martini, Doug Aldridge, you know, I got Zach Wilde, everybody, Jen Jennifer Batten's on me. But, you know, it, it's difficult. I mean, if I would have released that in the, like, 80s, 70s, 80s, it would have been all over the radio, you know? Right. And the, the label says to me, I'll put it on you, post it, post it, post it, post it. When I post stuff like that, nobody buys anything mm -hmm. I'm, I'm from the Facebook for me. I get, I don't know if it's the audience is too old or they just, you know, that, that doesn't hit them. They probably hit them off to hear an ad on the radio and heard the music, you know? Mm. Anyway, yeah. let's talk no. about Led Zeppelin. <laughs> All good points, though. I mean, absolutely good points. And actually, that's drives it around. Actually, uh, you know, so Gretchen, I'll ask you, because we just heard where Carmine, where you heard Led Zeppelin. You heard him literally on stage right in front of you. But Gretchen, where did you yeah. first come across Led Zeppelin as a, as a listener and a fan as a kid? Yeah, I um, one of my good friends, her name's Ashley, had parents who were really into classic rock. And so I got more and more exposed to that as a kid. Um, and I remember her becoming obsessed with the song Stairway to Heaven and her playing it for me. And I was just of a, you know, a more whatever energetic disposition. So 14 year old me hearing that that song initially I'm like eh, it gets cool later <laughs> you know but I heard from the levee breaks and I was like okay I don't know what you're talking about that's the song that's the song so that was my introduction to Led Zeppelin and then of course in time I I recognized why why the whole album is so brilliant but but it was it was pretty early on it was before I started playing guitar it was kind of my gateway into guitar centric music yeah, well said. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, Jimmy Page was one of the first guitar players. Jimmy Page and Jimi Hendrix were the two guitar players I learned the most first. Also Metallica. That's those. But Jimmy Page, what, what a great teacher! Even the first time you never met those. Those that, riffs. That's a hell of a combination: Metallica, Jimmy Page, and Jim, Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> yeah, well, a little Tony Iommi too. But yeah, yeah, right before those guys. But I mean, what all four of them? Just the, the masters of their their instrument and in, in their own ways. Well, mm -hmm. you know, Hetfield and and Hammett, but. Uh, Jimmy Page, just, just he and Iomi alone, you know, the rifts between them, I mean, they, they've got the market cornered. I mean, Jimmy Page is just an incredible teacher playing along with, with those. I just loved it. I, it was, I just couldn't get enough. And it took me a long time to realize the greatness of the other three guys because I was just so I was so fixated on Jimmy Page. But, I mean, all three of those other guys, and, you know, talking about Led Zeppelin's impact on heavy metal, one of the arguments I make is really – if you watched MTV in the 80s, you saw a thousand people who looked and sounded so much like Robert Plant. I mean, how many 
how many? I mean, when I was watching videos in the '80s, either Carmine was in the band because you were in so many bands back then. Carmine, you know, it's either you or, or it was a band that had a guy up with big blonde hair with his shirt open who was kind of going hitting those high notes. And Robert Plant, he absolutely defined that role. Heavy metal would look nothing well, like it. Well, I, I don't know if you knew this, but the Led Zeppelin was was kind of um, the template for Led Zeppelin was the Jeff Beck group. The original Jeff Beck group was Rod Stewart. Yeah, well, that makes so, sense. Okay, and you had Rod Stewart was just unbelievable back then, and Jeff Beck was unbelievable back then, and Ronnie Wood played bass and was just a tremendous bass player, much better bass player than a guitar player, you know, and uh, that was the template. They had the same manager, Jimmy and Jeff grew up together in England, so they were very close. And, uh, you know, when Jeff Beck who played, Peter Graham, the manager, and Jimmy would go see the Jeff Beck group. And I think that's where, and they even had some of the same songs. You Shook Me on the first album was on the Jeff Beck Truth album. Mm -hmm. You know, did you know that? Mm -hmm. I haven't heard it. No, I, I got to check it out. Jack, come on, you got to get hip here. I know I'm on, I'm I'm on hip. I never said I was hip, but yeah, I got to check it yeah, out. I know, but there there was some. <laughs> there was, uh, the, the Truth album was a, was a trend-setting guitar album that really made Jeff Beck uh, a name guy after after the um, the Oddbirds, you know. And they were all good friends because they had the same manager. We had the same lawyer, Vanilla Fudge, Jimi Hendrix, Jeff Beck, the Oddbirds. Led Zeppelin, Herman's Hermits, the Rascals, all the same family of tech people. And uh, most of us were on Atlantic Records, you know. So it was a, right. see, back then it was different than it. It wasn't a business yet, you know. I mean, Led Zeppelin helped turn it into a business, you know. When they got so big, their manager you know, worked different deals with the promoters. It used to be, like you, you sell seven, eight thousand seats out, and you get paid seventy five hundred bucks. And the gross, even the go, even if the gross was um, forty thousand dollars, you know, you got seven. They paid the expenses, and the promoter made like thirty grand. You know, but Peter Grant said, no, 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 that's not good. You make ten percent, and we make the thirty grand. You know. <laughs> And they changed the whole business that way, you know. But up until that point, everybody made records, and Jimi Hendrix, everybody. And everybody went out on tour and just had fun. The radio played it. We didn't have to promote it, you know, like Facebook baloney. <laughs> we just went out and played and had a good time. Tore up hotels and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. If you if you read if you read my book, Stick It, My Life is Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, it's X rated, first of all. <laughs> but it's, but it's pretty pretty crazy, you know, crazy times, you know. And uh, there was one story of Led Zeppelin, if you want to hear it, when uh, we were yeah. doing that Equal Bill stuff. The Bonzo came up to me, and uh, first of all, Bonzo gave me Jeff Beck's phone number, said Jeff wanted to play with me and Tim from the Fudge. So, wow. So, but before that, we were on tour, and uh, and they were doing how many more times? You know that song, right? Oh, yeah. And in the middle, they do you play the bow too? Okay. Well, I got in the it. Middle, okay. <laughs> in the middle, they did the bow and the vocal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that stuff. <laughs> so Bonzo and John Paul Jones came off the stage, you know. So Bonzo called me and said, Hey, you know, it'll be fine. I said, Why? He goes, Why don't you and Tim go up instead of me and John Paul Jones? I said, Okay. He said, You know the song, right? I said, Yeah, yeah. It seems every night. <laughs> so we went up, and you know, after they did that, if the cue is a triplet, you know. So me and Tim are playing. So Robert's singing. He turns around to us, and he, he does like a like a double take, and he elbows Pagey, and he goes, "Look over there." And he, Pagey looks over and sees me and Tim. Okay, they continued the song, and we ended it the way they would end it. And then when we, we headlined that night, when we played our song Shotgun, which was on the charts, we did on the Ed Sullivan show and all that, they all came up and played with us. Bonzo was playing the Tom Tom next to me and my kid. 
And uh, John Paul Jones sat down with Mark at the keyboard. You know, uh, Jimmy plugged into his guitar amp was still up there. And uh, it, it was amazing. And Robert sang with and sharing shotgun with us. You know, those were, those were the fun days, you know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the people in the audience had no idea what they were seeing. Like they couldn't imagine they were seeing this no. music history right before their eyes. No, they didn't know that. And nobody knew that Led Zeppelin was going to be that huge, you know, at that point in time. They knew they were big, but, you know, everybody was big. We were big. They were big. You know, Jeff Beck group was big. You know, we were all doing, you know, thousands, 10, 10,000 seat theaters and arenas and all that stuff, you know. And they had no real great PAs in those days either, you know. Oh. Was, uh, there, were, there were no PAs. When we toured with Hendrix, it was a uh, voice of the theater, eight voice of the theaters, and they had the board on the side of the stage, and it was knobs, big knobs, you know. I had a uh, a dual showman amplifier, a friend of dual showman amplifier, with um, a little sure mixer with five mics on my drums. We put him right up near the front of the stage so you could hear the drums better. And there's a picture with Jimi Hendrix going up to his amp. I had my amp and said Carmine on it. And Mark Stein from the front amp said Mark, because he had his he had his uh, Leslie's going through the amp. And there's a picture of Hendrix turning his Marshall up. And you see these other two amps that said Carmine and Mark on it. It's pretty funny. You know, today it's funny. In you know, back then it was, you know, it was funny. And I'm Hendrix speaking. called Hendrix called Led Zeppelin excess baggage. Oh, shit. He didn't like it. Wow. See, I'm speechless, and Karma, you to get me speechless. I mean, that these stories are blowing <laughs> me away. Um, I was going to say, you know, Hendrix is another person we could have the same kind of discussion about. Obviously, Hendrix also clearly not metal, but clearly, what would metal be without him? I mean, like I said, that's a whole yeah. different conversation. But, uh, yeah, that's right. Um. But wow, <laughs> that's incredible. All right, Gretchen, I need you to ask the, ask the question because I'm, I'm a little. <laughs> I, I know it's, it's, it's hard. Not, like, keep talking. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that's least... what I would say. I got, I mean, how, what, what can I possibly add to this other than, <laughs> yes, please, more of this? How many yeah. more times? It's an interesting one to jump in on. I mean, I'm just thinking about this from the standpoint of how many people want to sit in with Zepparella and the songs that we've determined are not songs that people sit in on well because of certain things that are very specific but i guess if you're touring and have heard them all night and if you're carmine yeah. and stuff it's no problem to hop yeah when the other band know, knows your arrangement you know, if you've done like you know we did i don't know 30 shows that that summer yeah you know and actually when we played uh in new york we played the single bowl which is like a ten thousand seat outdoor little stadium and it, it was a weird combination of groups. It was the Edwin Hawkins singers, which sang a song called Oh Happy Day, which was like a Christian song. It was a big hit song. Then after them was 10 years after. Right? You know who they are? Yeah, hmm? Alvin Lee is a Alvin great Lee. Yeah. And then there was the Jeff Beck group and then Vanilla Fudge. We were the top of the bill. So while Jeff Beck group was on, Led Zeppelin went on and jammed with them. Right. And John Bonham stood up and took off all his clothes. He's standing up there <laughs> naked. Why? I don't know. <laughs> My mother and father were there. My mother comes backstage and says, why did he take off his clothes? I go, um, I don't have a clue. But not, <laughs> not long after that is when he gave me Jeff Beck's phone number. After we played. And, we're, and you know, how do you follow Led Zeppelin and the Jeff Beck group? Jamming <laughs> together with Vanilla Fudge. That was the night me and Tim said, we got to move on to a guitar kind of band. And when Bonzo said, Jeff Beck wants to play with you, fine. We did a Coke commercial with Jeff Beck as Vanilla Fudge, you know, and uh, it was a guitar player, was, he was sick. So, cause we had the same lawyer, Jeff was in town. So he came and played with Vanilla Fudge on this Coke commercial that's on YouTube actually. And he played Wawa on it and it was pretty cool. And for some stupid reason, I don't know why me and Tim Bogart sang it instead of our lead singer Mark Stein who sang most of the great songs <laughs> you know so somebody emailed me um I did an interview yesterday and he said you know is this BBA doing this Beck Bogan a piece or is it Vanilla Fudge and I said no this is Vanilla Fudge doing it 
But it was really BBA with Mark Stein from the fudge. It was me and Tim sang it, and the way we sang it is the way we sang in BBA. You know? It's funny. Nice. Uh, great stories, man. It's, it's unbelievable. Um, you guys got to read my book, but you know, like I said, Gretchen, it's, it's X rated. Oh, I already wrote it down. <laughs> oh, you did stick it. My life's a sex drum. Jack, you should read it too. There's a lot of history in there. I, yeah. I, I finished a, a Steve Lukather's book pretty recently. That's, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, he's a good guy. He's got good stories. He does. Yeah. He does, Steve. Yeah. But, but the yeah. good thing about my book, it goes back to the beginning mm -hmm. of this stuff. You know, like it goes back to when I used to play in New York and, uh, and, um, we used to play opposite another band. The other band was Jimi Hendrix. He was called Jimmy James. You know, so I used to know him before he made it. You know, wow. and, uh, but I won't give away the story. It's in the book. So anybody that's listening, you got to go buy the book. Yeah. You get no, it on my, like if you get it on my website, I'll autograph it and send it to people. <laughs> nice. All right. I'm sold. Yeah, I'm a sucker for a good, uh, bio good rock and roll biography or autobiography. Oh, yeah. So this is, this is killer. Yeah. I guarantee you money back if you don't think that's killer. <laughs> there you go, everyone. What else? What else can you ask for? Um, and but I mean, you know, that's Led Zeppelin. I mean, I actually didn't even touch on this in the article, but they were the when you talk about rock and roll excess and the parties and the trash hotel rooms, they're the first name that comes to mind. I mean, maybe Def Leppard's number two, but I mean, Led Zeppelin. The stories are legendary. The ways they wrecked hotels and the, those, uh, those kinds. You of know, things. the Mud Shark story with Led Zeppelin. The Mud Shark story. Yeah. It's in my book. And All right. I was Jeff, there. You don't know that one? I feel like that's the one. That, it, was yeah, my, that's... It, was, it was my groupie. You know? okay. <laughs> and uh, the whole oh. story is in there. It's, unbelievable. it's really x rayed. It's crazy. You know, I couldn't <laughs> believe it after time. And it all happened in my room. I had to vacate my room. You know? <laughs> so. <laughs> So, it, you know, and then I told that story to Frank Zappa and he wrote a song about it on Mother's Invention live at the Fillmore. It's called Mud Shock. That's probably on YouTube too. And he, I mean, it's hilarious when I couldn't believe when he put that out. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go, you just sold the book there. there Steve Lieberman said, oh my God, just oh, grab no, my phone and Carmen in Pieces Live, I'm buying the book. Bye. Uh, Comradepeace.com. Okay, I mean, let's, yeah, but let's talk a little bit more about I just about um, about well, let's start with the four guys. I mean, you know, Led Zeppelin is one of the great examples where I mean, Beatles, Led Zeppelin, where there's, there's these four pillars, these four gods, you know, rock gods. So, but Bonzo, I mean, he really introduced he drumming wouldn't sound like it does now if it wasn't for well, of course, you, you, of course, present company, but I mean, you know, Bonzo's impact on the world was just it was like oh, yeah, a awesome. volcano going on. Awesome. Um, he was a, he and, was you know, a killer about, drummer, killer drummer. Yeah. And John Paul was I mean, even, so talented and very nice and easygoing yeah. guy, you know. And Jimmy Jimmy Page was very introverted. He never really, you know, like, we. he never came out of his room and joined the festivi festivities. You know, one time we put a um, fire extinguisher under, underneath the door and set it off of his room, <laughs> and it ruined all his English boots. And he really got pissed off, but you know, because he never came out and joined the parties with us, you know. And Robert was, Robert was a really nice guy, you know, easy going too. I remember walking on Santa Monica Boulevard and telling Robert, "I think you should move around more." <laughs> that was before their album, the first album came out. I think about that, and I laugh, you know, because he turned wow. into such an amazing front man. Let uh, you know, just. Just his look and his stance, and you know, he was so sexy to women, and uh, his voice was unbelievable. You know, the way he sang. But right, yeah, I'd say we'd, we'll never see his like again. But we saw so many people who tried to be him. But uh, yeah, he he truly was one of a kind. But Gretchen, I mean, yeah. same question to you. What, what do you feel about just the way that the, these four guys just just changed the world, each each on their own, each in their own way? Well, I mean. I can't I can't possibly speak to it with the the true closeness that that Carmine has to it. <laughs> what I can say is that learning the music of Led Zeppelin is a wonderful education. Is that oh, um, yeah. you know when you tell people that you, you 
play somebody else's music. It's funny if you, you know, I started on classical guitar. Nobody ever gives you attitude when you say you're playing a Bach prelude, but you tell somebody you're doing Zeppelin covers and sometimes there's a, a certain snobbery that, that goes on, you know, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, I just think, well, every time I've read an interview with one of my heroes and they are talking about how they learned to play, it's always that they learned their favorite songs by their favorite musicians. And so for me, I'm very lucky that it's paid, it's been paid education for me. Zapparella is the second professional band I've ever played in. And the fact that I've been doing this for a number of years now has opened up possibilities and, and things that I need to do in order to be able to deliver the music, you know, with the justice or the best that I can do, at least. It means that I have to do everything from like learning to be able to be at least adept on slide playing, playing beautiful acoustic songs and open tunings, abusing a Les Paul with a violin bow, uh, improvising. Um, th there's so many things you get to do. You get to play everything from like, you know, deep, bluesy, emotional things like Since I've Been Loving You to things that are really energetic and in your face, like Immigrant Song and Communication Breakdown. So it, it's a very wide palette you get to have. And the fact that every one of those guys, at least from where I sit, has influenced how they're um how how a whole generations of people approach the instrument you asked a rock bassist who are who are your influences chances are john paul jones is going to be one of them you ask drummers you ask singers you ask guitar players they're always there um and so like you said to have four who are all such titans in their own right um be in a band together there's almost this sense of maybe it's seeming inevitable but hindsight's 2020, I guess you can never really know, right? Plenty of all and, and Jimmy Page, as uh, introverted, like I say, Jimmy was kind of, mm -hmm. he was he's the whole machine behind it. He was the producer. He he put the, the whole thing together with Peter Graham, you know? And, uh, you know, when they got Robert and John Paul Jones and Jimmy Page, and Jimmy was the Yardbirds guitar player. We did gigs with Vanilla Fudge with him, so we knew him. Mm -hmm. And but the, John Paul Jones was a big arranger and a big session guy in England, so so Jimmy got him, and they got two new guys. You know, Robert got Bonzo because he used to play with him in his same town, you know, and uh, they were working class guys, you know, they didn't come in you know, from the Bonzo and Robert. I'm talking about the other two, Jimmy, were you know, already made money good money doing what he did, you know, when he had the Oddbirds going and all that. And Jeff Beck played in the Oddbirds too, and Jimmy, one of them played bass. I don't know who played bass. I think Jimmy might have played bass, you know. But um, it was amazing times. It was very, everything was new, you know. Everything was new. Vanilla Fudge was new, and then Deep Purple, you know, was influenced by Vanilla Fudge, and they started doing that thing. And they opened up for us, and we met those guys, and then you know, and everybody was like friends with each other. And it was really, it was really a great time for music, you know, a great time for music. And what I liked about Zeppelin when they got in later days, like um, Black Dog, when, it, you know, things in time signatures they did, the ocean, you know, since so seven, yeah. eight timings, you know, that was, that was kind of, you know, before a lot of bands were doing that stuff, you know. I mean, Vanilla Fudge did some stuff in six eights and you know in nine nine eight and stuff like that. But never played hard and heavy like that. We always played it like in you know uh, symphonic kind of things, you know. But to play like you know da 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 only syncs up with the drums because the guitar riff itself That's it's right. like i believe it's like 13. it, it crosses over after yeah a so four it, bars comes back so, to one well well the no the the first the first beat of it that first downbeat that da 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 right it, that syncs up with the one two times in the whole song at yeah. the, the very top and then everything else it just kind of keeps moving and moving and, and the bridge is kind of weird too da 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 da, -da you know the way it oh, goes yes. into that is very That's, weird that's a, that's a song that, that Zapparella has determined nobody gets to sit in on that song because the structure oh. of it is everybody thinks they know it. And until you're there actually being like, wait, doesn't the, does this happen like six and a half times? Or, you know, it's like there's yeah. everything odd, but it feels so 
right that um, that that it's yeah. it's subtly more difficult than same I thing going. happens in black talk, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the next part. Yeah, da 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 it goes out with the guitar, but then it comes uh -huh. back after like four bars. Yep, yep. It's totally. brilliant stuff, really cool stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, loved, I loved all that stuff. And, and you know, when it came out, when it actually came out, it hasn't been out for 50 years, you know, all of us musicians went, wow, that is so badass, you know? Because it really was, it was badass, it was cool shit, you know? Right. Black Dog, I think, is deceptively because, you know, it, it sounds like just kind of a horny kind of rock and roll song, but it's, it's yeah. so deceptively powerful. But Cashmere also, I mean, that song, that yeah. is one of those ones that, yeah, if you're going to screw, you can't let anyone screw that up. I mean, if you're going to do that, you have to do it perfectly. It's too sacred. I, mean, I, the, I played uh, at one of those Bonzo bashes. I played Black Dog, you know, and the hardest part with this is when you go, hey, my blues, one, two, but -da 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 -da, you know. And, and and on the record, they some of them are one, some of them are two, some of them are three. You know, they're not the same. And they you probably that did that deliberately, click. right? There's like a really uh, quiet, like hi hat click, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. I just usually watch my drummer's arms. <laughs> but, uh, well, so I did it with them. I said, let's just uh, because we, I never played with you guys, let's just count two. You know, it's bomb, bomb, da 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 da. You know. Otherwise, it's, you know, if you never played with somebody, you jam a black dog, good luck. Yeah. How, how about the, um, the the drum intro to rock and roll? Now, that is basically Little Richard's Keep a Knocking. But coming that? in, yeah, it's like. Yeah, but it comes in weird. It comes in like on the end of three or something? Yeah, I never, I never really learned how to play it. But the end of rock and roll is something that I did on, on, um, Shotgun in 1969, which is like four or five years before that, you know. But you know, when it came out and Bonzo did that, I said, "Hey, man, you stole my ending!" And we both <laughs> laugh and have a good time, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, now you know, now when I, if I say that blatantly, you know, you stole my ending, you know, I get all this hate mail—not really hate mail, but hate comments on. On an interview, you know, who did the egomaniac come on a piece? You know? <laughs> it's talking to print the truth, you know, this is the way it was, you know. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there are a lot of parallels. <laughs> there are a lot of parallels across the lines. I mean, I, I even said in the article, it's times where Black Sabbath riffs, you know, that show up on Led Zeppelin albums and vice versa. And you just kind of, yeah. but no one was suing anybody. No one was saying that it was a ripoff. It was no. just kind of, like I said, dazed and confused and I mean, paranoid. Communication, but... bre communication breakdown and paranoid. It's almost the same riff. Yeah, you know, and I play with Ozzy, and now I'm playing it. I'm thinking to myself, it sounds like communication breakdown. Right first time <laughs> I played it with him, you know. And you know, they came out when my group Cactus came out, Black Sabbath. And back, you know, it's amazing how you know it, when it stands the test of time, it turns into something else. You know, like when they came, when they first came out, it wasn't like wow, Tony Iommi is so unbelievable, you know. That came about after a while. You know, he's a great guitar player. And he influenced yeah. a lot of things. He tuned down, he did a lot of new stuff. Like I said, back then, new stuff was new. You know, now everything's been done, pretty much, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll say in the 80s, I think Tony was and Black Sabbath were taken for granted. I think because also they were still there. Led Zeppelin were already on their pedestal because we'd lost Bonham and and you know then yeah. they came back and did Live Aid, which was just changed the changed the world. And, and so yeah, with Phil Collins playing drums, is awesome. Yeah. yeah, I know he's he's but, taking some shit for that, but I think I I don't know. I tell you what, I, you know, Black I like Black Sabbath with Ozzy and all that, but I mean I really like Black Sabbath with Dio and my brother. They they added funk and soul for that band. You know, as yeah. far as I'm concerned, you know, people may say, oh, you're totally wrong. But <laughs> the Sabbath band with Dio was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Even, even when Bill, Bill Ward played on the Heaven and Hell record, Dio made them all sound better. You know, yeah. because he's I such mean, a great voice. Oh, my God. 
Yeah, what a man, you know, what a perfect talent, what an amazing talent. And you know, and Dio, of course, is on um Stargazer from Rainbow, which is again, I have the, yeah. the word on the street, you might actually know, Carmen, you might have been there, but apparently uh, Richie Blackmore said, I want to make a new cashmere, and, and that's where Stargazer came from. But apparently, yeah. I mean, that's the that's oh, the funny. Rich, Richie Blackmore asked me to join Rainbow, and I couldn't do it because I had another band I signed to MCA with Mike Bloomfield. And you know, that's one of the, one of the, I had a couple of times in my career when that stuff happened. You know, I was asked to do that big white snake album. I couldn't do it, so I had King Cobra. Right? They came out and did 27 million albums. I went, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, but but you know, it's uh, that's the way it is. But uh, we knew Richie from the Deep Purple days, and and he got Coach Powell to do it, and that's the band with Ronnie. Yeah. You know, when I heard it, I said, oh, man, I wish I could have done that band, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, but you, again, you've had some amazing, amazing moments in your career. I mean, so many. There's too many to mention. I mean, I'll, I'll yeah, say it. I'll call I'm, it I'm my... good. I'm good. I'm, I'm happy, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I, I can't imagine. I was going to say, I got to call out Blue Murder. It's one of my favorite drum oh, albums yeah. of all time. But this just, just, just blows me away. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I went after that band. Uh, again, Cozy was in that band. You know, I always kept saying, man, Cozy gets all these damn good gigs, you know. <laughs> after I couldn't play with Jeff Beck, Jeff Beck got Cozy. The Rainbow got Cozy. I, I used to tease him, and I wouldn't be my professional replacement or what? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, he was a friend of mine. You know, you know these guys are just such icon names. They're, for me, they're friends of mine, you know. And we used to goof off and like anybody else, you know, kid around, you know, bust balls, you know. And, uh, but, um, so when Sykes and, and Tony uh, blew out, or whoever blew out, the Cozy and, and, and who was the singer? Uh, the guy from Badlands. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Ray Gillen. Ray Gillen, yeah. yeah, Ray Gillen. When they, they left, I said, man, I got to I gotta try and get in Blue Murder. I love Sykes and I love Tony Franklin. I went to England when my brother Vinny was playing with Dio and they did four nights at the Hammersmith Odeon. I said, if somebody there is going to know how to get a hold of Sykes. <laughs> so I went there, I spent four days with, with them, I jammed with Dio, we had a great time. Sure enough, this guy, Chris Welch, you know that name? He, he was a big writer with Melody to Make a magazine. And he wrote a book called The Thunder of Drums, which is the only book written that has interviews with John Bonham when he came back from touring with Vanilla Fudge and he was raving about meeting me, you know, because, you know, at the time he, he was unknown, you know, and he used to hang out with Cozy Powell and then Cozy was asking, what's it like? What was it like? You know, all that kind of stuff, you know, and I didn't know this until I read the book, you know, and uh, anyway, he said, I have the number to call. So I called the number, it was John Sykes' stepdad's number. I called him, I said, I'm in England, I'd like to come and check out Blue Murder. They said, okay. So I drove there. Uh, I had a car rent, I took three hours to go to Blackpool from London. I had one CD, uh, one tape to listen to, it was Permanent Vacation by Aerosmith. Kept listening to it over and over and over and over and over until I got there and the Tony Franklin met me at night. He busted open the bar. He was an alcoholic at the time. And we had a drink at 2.30 in the morning. Got up the next day, went to John's house. He had a studio, a proper studio there. And guess whose drums I played? I played Cozy's drums, <laughs> right? And after we played, it was magic. It was magic. And Sykes came up and said, man, we play with all these different guys. They're all good. So you got so many drum fills. Oh my God. You know, I said, yeah, well, you know, okay. They said, if you want the gig, you got it. I said, all right, let's do it. And we did it. Wow. And, and because it didn't make it as big as he wanted to make it, he, it, it got all messed up, you know, and then Grunge That's... came in and then we were like dinosaurs, you know, so that was like the end of it. Well, it's a great piece of metal history to me. I know it's not way off topic. We're supposed to talk about Zeppelin, but man, that Boomer no, album is just... It's a, it is a great record. It is a great yeah. record. And Bob Rock was the first record he ever produced. And we did the drum tracks twice. We did them to a click. So at that point in time, I was, I was into um, 
I was already into from working in a posture studios and a quiet riot. So I developed the drum sound there with them because I, I recorded with Ted Nugent out there. And they released my first solo album, Pasha. And I said, this drum sound sucks, man. We've got to fix it. And I worked with Andy Johns. Andy Johns, you know, did Zeppelin, he did Who, he did everybody. Mm -hmm. And we experimented with drum sounds when I worked with him with Rod, like Hot Legs and those albums with big, fat, killer drum sounds. So I told, at the time, Dwayne Barron was a second engineer. And we brought in wood. We set the drums up a certain way, mic in a certain way, like Andy. And we come up with this killer drum sound. And that was the drum sound that Frankie Benelli had on the first Quiet Riot record, you know, which was very bonzo y kind of sound, you know? So, yeah. And uh, so we did all those drum sounds, and recordings in those days were clicks. We just punch in because I got fed up. I said, man, why does the drummer have to do? take after take to get the right drum track, you know? And then the bass player can punch in, the guitar player can punch in, the lead singer can punch in. And I'm here, take 15, you know? I said, we gotta be able to punch in. So we started experimenting with playing to a click and punching in on tape. And it was great. So by the time I was doing it with, with Blue Murder, I would, I've been doing it for five or six years already, you know? and so we did the first round of the album, and then by the last two or three songs, the drum sound was really getting great. You know, and it was on analog, and it was sounding great. So Bob Rock said to me, look, we're getting a much better drum sound now. You want to go back and recut this stuff? I said, definitely. You know, so I went back and recut every track, and I listened to every drum fill. If I had done that drum fill before, I replaced it. I made sure every drum fill on that record was different. That's how sure I was that that record was going to be huge. I was never so wrong. <laughs> but it became a legendary underground classic record on heavy metal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. In the heavy metal world, right? Everyone who was there, I think, holds that album in reverence. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe it didn't hit, you know, maybe it didn't get to Madonna heights of popularity, but, you know, that's all right. That's all right. It didn't even reach Quiet Riot popularity <laughs> <laughs> uh well you know they were number one that was a big deal too yeah, but um I, 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 but well i mean i know we've been i don't want to tie up your guys entire evening we we could do this for three more hours as far as i'm concerned yeah. but i want to ask say i mean i mean just to well, let's round out the discussion a little bit i, I mean i think we kind of nailed it that that of course i'll just say you know if you read, read my article i'm not even trying to say led zeppelin was a heavy metal band you know they just they touched everything they did stuff that had country sounds they did stuff that yeah. had they touched everything, but heavy metal, they're absolutely- They were, they they were what we called heavy rock at yeah. the time. It was heavy rock. It wasn't like cactus and even Black Sabbath was heavy rock. They weren't heavy metal. I don't know where this heavy metal thing came from, to tell you the truth. It was all, all those bands, Deep Purple, they were all, if anybody was the first heavy metal band, it was Blue Cheer. Yeah. Did you ever yeah, hear Blue Cheer? Side. I've heard that said, yeah. They had like, Three stacks of marshals for the bass player, three stacks of marshals for the guitar player. It was fat, heavy, really loud, heavy sounds, you know. But the, the term heavy metal wasn't around yet. It was just like that band was heavy. Heavy is there somehow, you know. And they say it came from uh, Steppenwolf, Heavy Metal Thunder, and uh, Born to Be Wild, but they were talking about the motorcycle, you know. Not, right. not anything, not any music, you know, but so it was Led Zeppelin was a heavy rock band. Cactus was a heavy rock band. Um, Black Sabbath was a heavy rock band. Deep Purple was a heavy rock band. Vanilla Fudge was a heavy rock band. You know, all those kind of bands, Jeff Beck, heavy rock, you know. And then somewhere yeah. in the 80s, it got turned into heavy metal and it was like Quiet Riot which were no heavier than Led Zeppelin, you know? Right. So Led Zeppelin yeah. was more versatile, like you said, versatile, you know? Right. And that's kind of where I was, where my whole point was. That's where I was going with that. Is, yeah, they, they deserve credit for all that they've done for heavy metal and all the things about them that were heavy metal. And Gretchen, I, I don't, I want to make sure you can weigh in on this too. I mean, what did, I know heavy metal is a label and all, but what are, what are your thoughts? on? I mean, you know, I'm labeled the heavy metal drummer. Now, you know, 
I'm not really a heavy metal drummer. For me, I, I consider what the heavy metal is, is like Metallica, Slipknot, all that stuff, where the, where the bass drums follow the guitar. And the guitars are the razor edge guitars. That, to me, is what heavy metal is. You know? I don't know if it's called something else, trash metal. What, what is Slipknot called? Is that heavy metal? They're called new metal. That's where, yeah, Slipknot is. But yeah, Metallica's thrash. Um, yeah, right. All the subgenres. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. It's all rock. It's all music. But what should, what, what sh a label that should be changed is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It should not be called that anymore. It should be called the Music Hall of Fame. Come on, bring it in Dolly Parton. You know, she's a great artist, but she's not a rock artist, you know? Right. I'm sorry, but I thought it was about influence, you know? I thought that's what a Hall of Fame is supposed to be, about influence. You know, like uh, Blues Hall of Fame, you know, they're going to have John Lee Hooker and all those guys because they influenced everybody, you know? And then you get the Go-Go's. Did they influence people? I don't know. Did they? Gretchen, did they influence you? <laughs> no, that doesn't mean I don't think that they're Say no more. But... <laughs> and, you're a, and you're a female guitar player and you're a female group. Why they got in there, I don't have a clue. And there's a bunch of other ones that got in there. And then, like, and I don't think Alice that, Cooper's in there yet, is he? Really? I, I don't know. I, don't I think it, so. it always shocks me who is and isn't in there. And, yeah. and, and in all fairness, I, you know, uh, I never picked my heroes based on their gender. You know, it was all so, so no, I didn't. Of course, you know, not. Of course not. Yeah, I never felt like, oh, I can't play guitar because I don't see mostly women doing it. It <laughs> didn't occur to me. I'm lucky. Have a good dad, you know. Um, no, but, I get it. You know, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Why, why, why the go go's? You know, why some of these other bands? I mean, Alice Cooper started. I mean, really, the guy that started all this makeup and all that. So you know who that was? Mm -hmm. Arthur Brown, English guy. He had a song oh. called Fire. Fire. Crazy World. And, um, Crazy World. Yeah. Arthur Brown. He started that. He's nowhere in, near it. Alice Cooper then picked up on Alice Cooper and got some vanilla funds at, at the whiskey, you know, 1967, you know, but he started that stuff and Alice was the actual act, you know, if he's not in there, how do these other acts get in there that aren't the actual kisses in there because of their stage show and theatrics, you know, but Alice not in there, that's crazy, man. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has been to do Led Zeppelin, but, but it's, <laughs> it's something that's been, you know, on my mind. And when I hear all these crazy people, I say, I mean, fine, you want to get them in a Hall of Fame, call it something else. Call it the Music Hall of Fame, you know, you bring it to the next level. Then you can bring Frank Sinatra in there, you know? Right. You know? Yeah. But, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Been being part of a hall of fame. I know sometimes it's difficult to get artists on board and all that stuff, but I agree. I mean, Dolly Parton's great. I'm not, trust me, audience. She's I'm awesome. Not saying anything she's awesome. Her, but she's great, yeah, but she's not a rocker. Role. Yeah. Not a rocker. You know, there's somebody else in, and then they got rappers in there too. You know, you know? <laughs> we actually got a, a long question here from Steve Lieberman. Basically he's, he's saying he's a karaoke singer. He's in a Zeppelin cover band or is it a part of a Led Zeppelin tribute band? As if you played four sticks with four sticks, and what are your thoughts after it if you did? Say again? Have you played the song Four Sticks? And no. have, did you use four sticks? Oh, okay. Because, you know, that's legendarily. I, I, I have used four sticks once in a while. You know, okay. But uh, that's in 5 4, I think, if that's what I'm thinking of. Bam, 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 Yeah. As a matter of fact, after I did the Bonzo Bash and I, I played Black Dog my own way, I got all this crap on the internet. Even though I got 1.4 million views on it, right? Which is nothing compared to like what Kid Rock's getting today. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got all these people commenting, I don't play like John Bonham, man, that sucks, blah, blah, blah. So then when they asked me to do another Bonzo Bash, I said, I really don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to put myself through the anguish of listening to these idiots on the on the internet. So I played four sticks with just clicking the sticks together. And I can play 
without drums by just playing with sticks. So I did four sticks on a microphone with uh, the guitar player playing it on acoustic, right? Oh, nice. And it was, it was cool, you know? Yeah, under underappreciated song too. That's, that's, yeah, that's good a great song. One. Yeah, good song. There's so many songs that got a great, you know, great rhythm songs. They're a great band, you know. I, I was bummed out when Bonzo died. I was in Europe I'm doing a clinic tour and playing with Rod. And uh, I was walking by, and I, I think it was Amsterdam Airport, and there's a newspaper and said, Led Zeppelin drummer John Bonham dead. And was a big exclamation point. I said, you know, so I knew his wife. I knew I knew Jason, who was a baby. John Bonham came to one of my clinics. I gave him a, a book to give to Jason because Jason was starting to play. You know, and no. uh, it was terrible. Anyway, wow. Yeah, see goes on. Yeah, and I know it's, I wanted to touch on Jason because I mean, what a great Led Zeppelin tribute band he does. He's I tell you what, you know, I was, I was very sure. suspect about it because. I knew Zeppelin. I knew the way they played. I knew that they never played the songs like the record. They played the songs. They spread out. They, you know, you know, they they extended every song. You know, they didn't. They jammed. And from what I saw on the internet, Jason just played it like the record. You know, so uh, me and Nico McBrain went to see Jason here in Florida at the Hard Rock. Tomorrow night we're going to see Deep Purple. You know. And Monday, I'm going to see Rod Stewart with uh, with Jason. So that's going to be interesting. But uh, nice. and I saw the show, and I loved it. I thought it was awesome. He did uh, when the levee break breaks, and he played the track of John Bonham. You know, just the drums, along with him. And then one time he, is, me, me and Nico go, man, I'm hearing two snare drums, you know. <laughs> But he played exactly, exactly like his, his dad. And, and then when he stopped for a minute, he put his hands up and the groove kept going. I said, yeah, I knew it. He's playing, that's his dad playing with him. So sure enough, when we went back and talked to him, you know, he, he saw us just before he was going up to get dressed. He saw me and Nico, you know. So when we went back to see him, I said, I said dude, I gotta say that was great. He said, I don't know, Carmine, were you sitting there counting how many Carmine drum fills I was doing? I said, no, I wasn't. Nico was. <laughs> you know? And Nico, he said to Nico, how many? He said, oh, I counted, I think, seven. You know, but, but it was funny. It's always fun, you know what I mean? Nice. But uh, I was proud of him. I, I said, your dad would be proud. I said, and then I said, yeah, I had your mom, you know, your sister, you know, the son of the family, you know. But uh, he's a good kid. They played great. The band was great. They didn't look like Led Zeppelin. Like this, the bald, bald-headed singer, you right. know. And uh, but Bonzo, yeah, and Jason had the same setup as Bonzo, with the gong. And by the way, when Bonzo got the first kit from Ludwig, he got the gong too, because I had a gong in my kit, <laughs> right? And, but uh, and then eventually he got the first pasty cymbal stand, gong stand that stood up because he lived in Europe. You know, he lived over there. And then I got it, you know, like six months later, because they didn't have a, Pasty didn't have a um, uh, a dealership in America, a distributor. You know, they just had a distributor. They didn't have a showroom or, or an A&R guy. So I had to wait from Switzerland to get things, you know. So England's a lot closer to Switzerland than, than New York City. So I did get the same stand, but it was after Bonzo had his, so it looked like, he had the gong first, but he had the big stand oh, first, you know. But, but we both had the gongs, and uh, that, those are amazing days, you know. Yeah. That's, anyway. Again, blown away. But Gretchen, yeah, before we go, Gretchen, tell, talk us a little bit through a, a Zeppirella show. I, like I said, I don't want to hold you guys yeah. up much longer, but talk us, to, talk us through a Zeppirella show. Tell us about that experience. Uh, Like set list wise or like yeah. just – Thing. Yeah, okay. Set list the whole thing. Yeah. What what is like what what yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, we don't try to look like the guys. Um I, I feel like we're already off the hook because we're not the right gender for um, <laughs> really okay. accurate. And also we didn't want to um we wanted just to honor the music, not 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 make it uh too much into the theatrics, which we thought could cross over into to mimicry that might not feel respectful. To some people, yeah. so so we 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 wear all white on stage, um, 
and uh, and and try to have a balance between the recorded stuff that people want to hear that they're attached to and yet also honoring the spirit of Zeppelin that nobody took more liberties with Led Zeppelin than Led Zeppelin did. You know, like Carmine said, it's like, you know, you'd hear them play how many more times and, you know, within how many more times I'd go into all of these old. It was, it you know, was 15 minutes long. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, dazed and confused. The way I approach that yeah. one um, is I, I watch a lot of like um, for I watch a lot of live Zeppelin. I don't learn like note for note live Jimmy stuff. I learned the album versions as note for note as I can hear them. And then I tried to uh, Stretch improvise. It out. Yeah, improvise within the realm of what would be Jimmy appropriate. So Good. that's how we, that's, that's what, how we try to approach what, it. Now, what, what's the typical set list? Uh, recently, let me, I can tell you right now. I just got the set list from my drummer today. She's the boss. Um, oh. We're gonna. Uh, yeah, we're, we're so starting. It's the way. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's the it's the right way. Um, we are starting with good times, bad times, communication breakdown, rock and roll, the Rover, Lemon Song. Immigrant song, uh, how many more times is probably going to go in there? Uh, the ocean, dazed and confused, bring it on home, ramble on, cashmere, Moby Dick, when the levee breaks, whole lot of love, and then we're coming back on to do an acoustic set. I've been playing a lot of acoustic guitar over this pandemic, and we're, so we're doing going to California. I'm doing the song that I have never pronounced correctly, uh, Branerer. I guess I had to research that because I just taught it <laughs> for a video. Um, it's the solo, um, the beautiful solo piece on uh, physical graffiti, solo guitar piece. So where are you guys from? Where are you guys located? San Francisco. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, our first shows back after the pandemic were, uh, were in New York at um, one show in Woodstock and two um, in New York City. We're um, in New York City. I'm trying to. I can't believe I'm spacing on the Sony, name. Sony Hall. Sony Hall. I wish. No, that's no. that's very flattering. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, what? Uh, no. Let, I'll tell you in one second. Um, I'll tell you in one second. I have to. I have to remember. I, I can't believe I'm spacing on the name of the place. But we played two nights at a, a, a cool club. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Where was it? Do you remember the location? It was. Sound I feel like. Right in the middle of it all. Here, I'll tell in you the for village, sure. In the village? It was, I remember because it was on my dad's birthday. Okay. And it was, oh, come on. That's not letting me pull it up. I'll think of it in like two seconds here. Okay. So, so we do, with, with Vanilla Fudge, we did that uh, Zeppelin you know, tribute album, basically. Mm -hmm. We arranged some of the songs. So we did live, we come back as an encore, we do. Days are confused into Babe, I'm gonna leave you, right, right in the middle of it. You know, so like yeah. you come through the, uh, you know, the bass player would start a doom, 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 and I'll play this different groove, almost like a uh, doom, 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 you know, a whole different feel on it. And then we do all that da 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 and then the keyboard player would start playing uh, and singing, Babe, I'm going to leave you. Right? So we do like a couple of verses of that into, you know, into some heavy bam, 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 bam. We do all that stuff. And then, uh, uh, and then we end that, you know, the way, the, the way Robert ends with the vocal. And then I go, bam, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. And when we do, we finish it, the audience goes absolutely berserk. Mm. They really go crazy because it's, you know, my, Mark Stein's just an unbelievable singer. He can sing like Robert Plant. He can, you know, he can improvise like he does improvising. It's awesome. And you know, when we we rock it, but I mean, I love playing it. You know, we did rock and roll on on our album, but I did a different intro. I did my own kind of intro. That I didn't know the way it goes, but you know, <laughs> we're known for changing stuff anyway. So, right. You know, it's all good. Yeah. Well, yeah, that came out about 15 years ago, right? I mean, we were talking about that. A it came out in 2005, and then uh, Golden Robot Records released it as a digital release in the last year. And every so often, they keep releasing a track, you know. So. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and they say, hey, put it on your, put it on your website, or put it on your Facebook. I mean, why? Nobody's going to buy it on my Facebook. <laughs> you know? you're, you're supposed to advertise it, not me. <laughs> Well, I want to say just this, this has been incredible. It's been an incredible talk. I, I appreciate you guys coming on. Like I said, I, I could keep this going for three hours, but we'll, we'll let you guys go and get back to your lives. But I want to say okay. this is Gretchen Men, Car- Carmen and Peace. It's been an honor talking to you, Paul. Uh, thank you. I'm going to hang up and go again. look at Zepparella on uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but both, both of you guys take a minute to promote. I know there's some cactus dates yeah. coming up this year and some other stuff. So, so take yeah. a couple of minutes to promote everything you got going on and everything you got for sale. And then oh. we'll then we'll cut. I got my car for sale. You want to buy? No. <laughs> no I, let's just say I got my guitar Zeus box set. I got that uh, Energy Overload instrumental album. And I got my book. And uh, we're working on a new King Cobra record right now. And uh, we got Carlos Cavazzo playing guitar and Rowan Robinson. And we got uh, Paul Shortino and Johnny Rod, who's the bass player. That's going to come out with that one too. And. Uh, we got cactus shows and stone girls, Iridium in New York, and uh, it wasn't Iridium, was it? That you played? No, no. I, I'm t- I'm tr- I'm trying to find it from my calendar because. Yeah, and we got old. we got Kent State. We're playing Kent State somewhere over there, and then we, in in April we got a bunch of shows with Vanilla Fudge. It's all on my website, GoRedPeace.com. Yeah. On VanillaFudge.com, it's on CactusRocks.com. So it looks like it was was it the cutting room? Yes. No. Yes. No, it was screwing me up because we play a place called the Chance in Poughkeepsie, and I'm like, it starts with a C, but it's not the Chance. Yes. No. Not the Chance. I know that place. Yeah. The Cutting Room. <laughs> the Cutting Room. Oh, it was the Cutting Room. Oh, that's yeah. my favorite place. My my buddy Steve owns that. Oh, we okay. Play there. T- we play there with Drum Wars. We we play that show with Drum Wars. And I, talk- I wish we were doing that with Cactus instead of the Iridium because I like it better. Yeah, uh, I love the place. Yeah, wonderful that's a good people. Place. Yeah, I did my I did my book uh, my book party there. Oh, know. cool! Yeah, it was a cool. lot of fun. Nice. A lot of fun. Okay, Very good. Cool. So I'm gonna look up Zepparella. Yeah. Okay. Some Zepparella right now. Some Zepparella live dates come in, and uh, and maybe even some uh, some Gretchen Men solo. Music yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I had some. I had a show, a, a few dates booked on the East Coast before all of the pandemic at the Cutting Room with uh, Jennifer Batten and Neely Brosh. Uh, that that has yet to get rebooked, but I know Zeppelin has a number of dates West Coast coming up, um, starting at the end of the month. Um, I'm working on my third solo album right now. Um, How and, do you spell uh, Zeppelin? Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't know for the first <laughs> week I was in the band and thought we didn't have a website. It's Z E P P A R E L L A. Okay. All right. Okay. Is that what we have on screen is that Z E P P A R E L L A. Yes, perfect. Okay. I've got tickets. I don't want to see videos. Come on. If you go to Zepparella.com, oh, you'll see the ones that aren't just people what you know filming me tune for you know. <laughs> Which one did you pull up? <laughs> oh no. Okay. Is that is it live or is it the, we'll see. I think it's live. I don't know. It just starts with a, an amp. Turn on the okay. amp. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like your video. There's you with red hair. Okay. That's nice. Cool. Very nice. Well, it's probably the perfect way to go out, right? So thank you guys so much. But Gretchen, I don't want to cut you off. Did you, did you get everything, no. everything out? Uh, no. No. Tell Dustin to get Gretchen's number. Uh, you know, okay. Number. Definitely will. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I hope I hope to talk to you guys both again. You're both welcome back anytime. Uh, thank you guys out there for watching. Yeah, and okay. yeah we'll we'll call it a night. Thank you very much. Thanks yeah, everyone. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye.